Hey folks, it's time for another installment of Say What Wednesday, where we examine the claim that multicultural education is going after the hearts and minds of young people. What? Welcome back to African Elements. If you're new to this channel, we're taking Black and Africana Studies material and bringing it to the masses. In this series, we're examining specific claims that relate to Black Studies to determine where they fall short in meeting their burden of proof. In this video, we visit Simon Webb, whose YouTube channel History Debunked claims that multicultural history degrades education in the service of cultural sensitivity. Does he make his case? If you already know the rules, then just skip to over here. But for now, let's go over the criteria to establish whether this claim warrants belief. I'm going to hold up a red light, yellow light, or a green light. Green means go, but I'll bring up a yellow or red light whenever I come to a point where we need to slow down or stop. That's either a bold claim with no evidence, a vague, overly broad, simplistic, or unfalsifiable claim, meaning there's no way to determine whether the claim is true or false, or something that's logically fallacious. Some logical fallacies include circular reasoning. This is true because it's true. We see that most often when someone makes a claim and then says a bunch of things that don't support the claim and then just repeats the claim. Other fallacies include the black swan fallacy, which basically asserts that because you've never seen something, it doesn't exist. We'll see that a lot. There are also appeals to emotion which often link a position to keeping children safe in some way without actually providing evidence that the children are otherwise in danger. I think you can see where this is going. Those are the most common examples of logical fallacies, but there are many others that I'm sure we'll encounter. So let's jump in. Hello again. I want to talk today about multicultural education, which most of you probably know it means trying to work in the perspectives of minority groups in society uh, to show their history, their cultures, religions and so on in the education provided for everybody. What? That's fairly accurate, but as we'll see, he doesn't seem to fully grasp what the goals of multicultural education are. The goal isn't to just shoehorn in various groups just for the sake of marking some checklist. In fact, being able to view events from multiple perspectives is an important tool for gaining a critical understanding of history. For example, there were different and often conflicting perspectives within the abolitionist movement. On one hand, there were many white liberals in the North who opposed slavery, but that didn't necessarily mean they wanted black kids sitting next to their children in public schools. For black folks, abolition was more than a struggle to end slavery. Theirs was a fight for social equality. Understanding these different perspectives is critical in order to gain anything more than a superficial and simplistic understanding of abolition, civil war, and reconstruction. Viewing these events through multiple perspectives is also important if one's to fully understand and appreciate how truly extraordinary white freedom fighters like John Brown were. For various historical reasons, People of African origin have contributed little or nothing to the art, culture, philosophy and science of Europe and North America during the 18th and 19th centuries. Black people didn't, did hardly anything at all of note in those centuries. What? Here we have a black swan fallacy. The black swan fallacy is a tendency of people to ignore evidence that contradicts their beliefs and assumptions and can also refer to the tendency to believe things they've never witnessed don't exist. The fact that he may be ignorant of the contributions of blacks isn't evidence that those contributions don't exist. So whether or not you consider something noteworthy is totally subjective, but let's take a few examples and use their reception by their contemporaries in the 18th and 19th centuries as a measure of noteworthiness. We'll start in Britain. In 1789, the interesting narrative of the life of Olauda Equiano was published. It became a bestseller and was translated into many languages and read by tens of thousands of people, which in the 18th century was certainly considered noteworthy. So noteworthy, in fact, that it was one of the publications that persuaded the British Parliament to outlaw the slave trade in 1807. 
Phyllis Wheatley, was a well-known and well-renowned poet in the Revolutionary Era. So much so, that in February 1773, University of Pennsylvania professor Benjamin Rush used Phyllis Wheatley's work to push the abolitionist case in his anti-slavery pamphlet and praised her singular genius. Early in 1791, Benjamin Banneker helped survey the nation's new capital, Washington, D.C. In confronting Thomas Jefferson's racist ideas, he sent Jefferson a letter and enclosed his yet unpublished copy of his almanac. On August 30, 1791, Thomas Jefferson forwarded the almanac to Monsieur de Condorcet, the secretary of the Academy of Science in Paris, along with a letter in which Jefferson called Banneker a very respectable mathematician. The past is now largely under the control of people who view history not as an objective struggle to uncover the truth, but rather as an ideological battle to control the hearts and minds of young people. What? Here we have an appeal to emotion fallacy that uses emotion in place of reason in order to attempt to win an argument. It's a type of manipulation used in place of valid logic. An appeal to emotion isn't necessarily fallacious if it's used in support of an argument, but it becomes fallacious if it's used in place of an argument. So what he needs to do here is to demonstrate that multicultural education is an ideologically driven effort to control the hearts and minds of young people. So let's have it. In a classroom recently, I saw a display around the walls and it was of great literary figures. It was designed to inspire the children. In the first place, all the other famous authors that are up on the wall, Mark Twain, Flaubert, Jane Austen, and so on, have written novels, plays, and poetry of great literary worth. For that reason alone, Sol Solomon Northup doesn't really belong there. He's associated only with an autographical work, the um, book called Twelve Years a Slave. It doesn't fit in with all the novels and fiction and other things that these people are famous for producing. What? Literary nonfiction is a genre of literature that uses factually accurate narratives with storytelling styles and techniques that include characters, setting, and plot. As most of you are probably aware, there was a film adaptation of Solomon Northup's book released in 2013 that closely follows the book. Both the book and the film contain characters, setting, and plot. Excluding 12 Years a Slave from the category of literature simply because it's not a fictional novel, play, or poetry is just an arbitrary application of the word literature. Sorry, but you don't get to just redefine words. The second reason is that there's no particular literary worth at all to um, 12 Years a Slave. It's not brilliantly written and no one pretends it does. It's a novelty, but it's absolutely atrocious and very heavy going to read. What? So this is clearly an opinion. I happen to think this, the book is brilliantly written, but that's my opinion. So again, let's assess this based on the reception of Solomon Northup's contemporaries. The book was published in 1853 and it sold 30,000 copies, making it a bestseller. Aside from that, this particular text is widely taught in English literature classes and history classes, including my own. The reason it has particular worth is because it illuminates in a powerful way two things about the institution of slavery that aren't universally well understood. Number one, it's not widely known that free blacks in the North were in constant danger of being kidnapped and brought into slavery, a phenomenon sometimes known as the reverse underground railroad. That's what happened to Solomon Northup and countless other victims of human trafficking who were born free in the North and were literally abducted and marched in chains to the Deep South and sold into slavery. The other thing that it illuminated was the horrors of the Fugitive Slave Act and the inability of blacks, free or slave, to testify in court on their own behalf. What that meant was that unless some white person was willing to speak on their behalf, these abductees, to put it bluntly, were shit out of luck. His autobiography makes that clear. Northup's ordeal ended only when a white man from his hometown of Syracuse tracked him down and spoke out on his behalf. 
For those two reasons, the book has enormous value in showing the abysmal nature of two often overlooked aspects of slavery. Finally, of course, Solomon Northup didn't actually write the book. That was done by a white man called David Wilson. What? So here he's using the word author and writer interchangeably, but ignores the distinction between the two. An author is the person who originates the idea, plot, or content of the work being written. The writer is the person who actually writes the book. For that reason, the author and the writer are not necessarily the same thing. So, is Solomon Northup the author of the book? Obviously, the writing comes from Solomon Northup's story, but let's go a bit further. How involved was Northup in formulating the story? According to Northup's biographer, David Fisk, author of Solomon Northup, His Life Before and After Slavery, Northup's role was significant. David Wilson, who actually wrote the book, said that Northup carefully perused the manuscript, dictating an alteration wherever the most trivial inaccuracy has appeared. Why was it done? The answer is that some governors of the school came by and noticed that all the wall displays had pictures of white people on them. This is a um, school in a very multicultural area of East London, so a large number of the pupils there are black. The governors insisted that some more black people were put up on the walls to increase the self-esteem of black pupils. What? How do you know that? He offers absolutely no evidence to support that assertion, and then also without evidence, makes an assertion about their motives. Uh, I don't like to be cynical, but about half the pupils have great difficulty stringing a sentence together or using correct punctuation or um, beginning sentences with capital letters. Uh, still, there we are, cultural sensitivity trumps literacy and ed education generally any day of the week. What? The reasoning here is just bizarre. We have a combination of circular reasoning with a side order of questionable cause fallacy. Questionable cause fallacy is where the cause is incorrectly identified. He's basically just saying over and over that Solomon Northup doesn't belong with these other authors, and then somehow connecting that without evidence to the cause that the children are underperforming. Literacy comes at the expense of cultural sensitivity. How are you connecting cause and effect? Even if I were to hand you on a silver platter that Solomon Northup was a terrible writer and he doesn't belong with Mark Twain or some of these other authors, let's say for the sake of argument, I just give you that. You already said that Mark Twain is included in the curriculum. He's on the wall and they're learning Mark Twain. So how does the inclusion of Solomon Northrup somehow have a counteractive effect that somehow offsets the value of Mark Twain and some of those other authors that you think should be and are included in the curriculum? How does that work? Anyway, this time there was a wall display with pictures of various black people and supposedly they were amazing black scientists and inventors. Nobody had ever heard of any of them. What? Correction, you have never heard of them. Yet another black swan fallacy. The fact that you've never heard of them is irrelevant to whether they exist or whether they're significant. One in particular caught my eye. It was this man. Under his picture was the absolutely astonishing and quite untrue statement that he was a mathematician and astronomer and that he had made the first clock in America in 1760. That actually said he'd invented the first clock in America in 1760. What? Not only was Banneker an astronomer, but again, according to Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner and a racist, Benjamin Banneker was a respectable mathematician. Now, they got the clock part wrong. He did make a wooden clock, which is an interesting feat of mechanical engineering, but he didn't invent it, nor was that the first clock made in America. 
Interestingly, it's at this point that he at least finally gives some shred of evidence to support his point that Benjamin Banneker didn't create the first clock in America. Just to put the matter beyond all doubt, here's a photograph of a clock which was produced around 1740, certainly earlier than 1745, made in Boston by a man called Benjamin Bagnall. That's the only shred of evidence that he presents in the entire video to support any of the assertions he's made, and it's about the clock. I guess that's important. I don't know why. I, for one, don't give a shit who made the first clock in America, but if it's important to you, okay, yeah. They got that one wrong. If the point here is that they got this wrong, therefore that debunks all of multicultural history, then what we have here is a composition fallacy, when someone assumes that something is true of the whole just because it's true of some part of the whole. By that reasoning, we should stop teaching US history altogether, just because some people incorrectly learned as a child George Washington chopped down a cherry tree. What we're seeing here is one aspect of multicultural education, which essentially consists of the colonization of British and American history by various insignificant people, uh, whose only claim to fame is their African heritage. It means that any semi-literate person is fit to be ranked alongside Mark Twain and to appear next to him, even if he can barely read and write, as long as he's black. What? For the moment, let's just ignore the fact that with absolutely no sense of irony, he uses the term colonization to describe the impact of multicultural history on British and American history. What we have here is a slippery slope fallacy. He's done nothing whatsoever to demonstrate that a semi-literate person has been ranked alongside Mark Twain. Again, according to Northup's biographer, he was able to read and write and was perfectly capable of telling a story. In fact, Northup had done over two dozen lectures throughout the Northeast where he told his story on stage. It's so much easier and more exciting if we simply say that nothing happened until a black man invented the clock in America. What? And let's top it all off with a straw man fallacy, just for good measure. Literally, nobody said that nothing happened in America until a black man invented a clock. Right. So let's do a final tally, shall we? Black swan fallacy. Two. Opinion or assertion without evidence. Four. Appeal to emotion fallacy. One. Circular reasoning fallacy. One. Questionable cause fallacy, one. Composition fallacy, one. Slippery slope fallacy, one. Straw man fallacy, one. Assertion supported with evidence, I'll give him one. Does he adequately assert the notion that multicultural education has some deleterious effect on young minds? And let's have a discussion on it. If you have any suggestions for Black Studies related videos where you suspect the reasoning may be flawed, drop a link in the comments below. Let's take a look. As always, a huge thanks to my patrons for your support. If you'd like to support this program, head over to my Patreon page at the link below where you can receive ad-free content for as little as a dollar a month subscription. Otherwise, a like and subscribe would also be greatly appreciated. This has been African Elements and I'm Darius Spearman. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the comments.